Welcome. This is a discussion between me and my dear friend Joseph, and we want to try to develop some perspectives based on our practice and understanding of the early teachings on what I believe is the most gravest crisis we are facing right now, which is global warming or climate change. And to get us started, I just wanted to briefly touch on the main points of what's taking place. Making things very simple, uh, the sunlight shines on the earth and is reflected as infrared. If that would just go out like that, the planet would be at freezing temperature. That infrared is being trapped by so-called greenhouse gas. And it is thanks to these greenhouse gases that the infrared stays long enough to leave enough warmth so that we have life on this planet. However, due to human consumption of fossil fuels, this greenhouse gas is increasing and the heat is increasing. Due to that, we have what we call global warming. And global warming is going to play out in ways such as melting down of the ice on top of mountains, depletion of drinking water resources, irregularity of weather, we will have more and more hurricanes, wildfires and all these kind of things. And the areas for production of human food are gradually reducing. And there will be more and more competition for food resources. And the water from the top of the mountains, it goes somewhere. It goes into the ocean, the ocean rise. We expect that within not too distant a future, Shanghai, Manhattan will be underwater, like Venice. So this is a really dramatic situation that is unfolding. And the fascinating thing is we know these facts for many years. Action, sufficient action is not being taken. And the problem is, I think, really the ability of the human mind to face this type of crisis. And I believe here mindfulness and Buddhism, the early teachings, have a major contribution to make. And this is what I would like us to explore in this conversation. So what, how do you see, how would you formulate the appropriate response? What, what can we do? What are the perspectives that come to your mind when looking at this scenario? So there are a few things uh, that come to mind. Uh, one is trying to understand why people are not more engaged. So given the magnitude of the problem, as you laid it out, uh, it's so big, you know, and so important. So then the question arises, why, <laughs> why aren't people more yeah. concerned about it and more active with respect to it? So that's one question. And the other is, for those who are engaged, how we can engage and still keep a balance of mind so we don't get, um, first that we don't get burned out, yeah. and also that we do whatever we do in terms of response with a wholesome state of mind yeah. rather than unwholesome. Yeah. Uh, so for me, as we, as we get into the conversation more, one of the key components along with mindfulness uh, which of course is the foundation, just being aware of anything, um, is compassion. Yeah. And how com the role compassion plays in both of these questions yeah. that I raise. And, uh, so that's at some point, I'd like to get into that discussion. Yeah, to my mind it is also compassion, particularly this basic sense of compassion as the wish for the absence of harm. Harm to myself and harm to others. Mm. And mindfulness in this ability to actually face the situation. Because I think uh, we have that tradition very beautiful in the Mahayana traditions, this compassionate emptiness, the two wings of the bird. And if we were to go just for the compassionate part, there's this near enemy, uh, according to Theravada tradition, is the suffering with, what in psychology we call the empathy, where I actually take in the pain of others or the world. 
And if I were to go for that, then I would very quickly get drained. And so for me, there always needs to be this, for myself in my own practice, I'm trying to find this balance point between the opening of the heart that sees the problem and at the same time having that stability, that equanimity, that seeing of the emptiness. And for that, for me, mindfulness is really crucial. So I would, I would really put mindfulness in the first place. In fact, when I was looking at the beautiful writings of the Karmapa on climate change and similar problems, for him, of course, with his background, very natural to put compression in front, and I'm fully there with the compassion. But I still feel that before going for the compassionate part, I first really want to have that mindfulness, that, that ability to simply be aware of the situation without feeling I have to immediately take a position, react, but simply being able to take it in without denying it and without reacting to it. <laughs> I, I think that, uh, in a way, the mindfulness and compassion and wisdom are inextricably linked. Yeah. So the reason I kind of was highlighting the compassionate side, because I see this even uh, when I'm watching my own mind, my, my own relationship to climate change, uh, and sometimes I wonder why I'm not more engaged, you know, in it, given that it's such a huge problem. So I think one of the, the motivating factors for arousing the energy to become more mindful, yeah. uh, at least I see this in myself, yeah. is a feeling of compassion. And then I, then I, was, I was just looking and trying to understand, well, what's the cause of that compassion to arise? And I think traditionally, and you can bear this out or not, uh, that compassion arises when we're willing to come close to suffering. That if we're observing okay. it from a distance, it doesn't affect us in that, yeah. in that full way. And so then it's really a question, if we do want to get engaged, we really have to come close. And this is where mindfulness, I think, plays such a critical role. Mm. It's mindfulness which can allow us to come close to suffering yeah. and still be in balance. And so one way I was trying, I was reflecting on how could, practically speaking, how could each of us come close to the suffering that's going to be caused? Because there are obviously some immediate manifestations of it, but the... the Devastating consequences yeah. are still in the future. Yeah. And so I think that's one reason people don't quite take it in. Yeah. So one exercise that I was beginning to do, and I, I think that it might be an avenue for some people, is to take even the examples of the deleterious effect of climate change now, like the flooding or the hurricanes or the fires, and then to actually do a little meditative visualization of... What would it be like if I was living or my house yeah. was there? Yeah. Because if it's somebody else and it's distant, yeah. Yeah. it's a bit abstract. Yeah. But if we can visualize ourselves there, then it's easy to feel the suffering yeah. and therefore the compassion. Uh, but it's a tricky, it's a tricky business because it, I see it as a practice. It's not we either have it or we don't have it. Uh, so I'll just give one, one little example. It's, it's sort of analogous for me, even though it was working on a much smaller scale. So in my time in India, you know, when I was practicing there for many years, uh, of course, anybody living there is coexisting with the reality of the wild and pitiful dogs, you know, who are just in terrible suffering, you know, mange and diseased and starving and... And they're pretty common, yeah. you know. Sometimes I would just be going down and having a tea in the local bazaar and these dogs would be around. And I could observe my mind do two quite different things. One thing it did was, I don't want to deal with this. I just want to have the cup of tea, <laughs> you know. And so I would kind of block it out, you know, and just, so they were there and there was no relationship. I really made them distant. 
And at other times my mind was more open and willing to actually look. Mm. And when I looked, the suffering was so obvious and so intense. And just that willingness to come close, the yeah. compassion arose yeah. and more often than not, then I would feed them something. Yeah. So the action, the response came out of the willingness to come close to it. Yeah. So that's where I see how compassion can play a, a really important piece in, in our response. Yeah. And what, what might initiate the response. Yeah. yeah, I really resonate with what you described there. For myself also this uh, really, I, I have taken a slightly different approach in my last retreat, uh, longer retreat I did uh, five weeks in the summer. I just went into this uh, vision of the whole earth being just barren and all human civilization disappeared mm. and things. Mm. That was my way of, yeah. of bringing it close. And I only, actually I think I only feel ready really to move out to do something about climate change from the time that I feel that I can hold that situation, that I could live through the, the grief of thinking the whole Buddhism disappear, all the beautiful things of civilization disappear, and, and to, be, to, to be with that. But I think what, what you just said about bringing it to us is also very important. There's a whole area of what we call climate justice, that uh, all the, the countries who have least contributed mm. <clears throat> get the worst. I mean, I am, I actually self-identify as a Sri Lankan. <laughs> I, I have, all my Buddhism comes from Sri Lanka, and so I still have all my connections there. And what they keep telling me is such a different world than what I experience here in the West. Because Sri Lanka and places like Bangladesh, and so they are so hard hit already now. And they, 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 they will get the worst thing right away, and they have done the least to contribute to it. It's actually the countries who are more secure, like the US, uh, Europe, Australia, who are making the major contribution. <coughs> and this not seeing on how, on how it affects, it really is exactly the failure of what mm. you say, that it's kind of, it's, it's over there. And as it's over there, like those manji dogs over there, and I'm going here to have my tea, and I can just create that distance, yes. and I can cut it out. And I don't need to deal with it, and that feels so protected. And mm. that is, I think you touched really on a key here. And that is really a pervading issue. And how do we... Good, that point you were just going to get your cup of tea, but now let's talk about Vipassana meditators walking the path to awakening. To what extent do we have the time, do we have the responsibility? Should we be looking at the manji dogs? Mm. Or to what extent we should just go Yes. <laughs> well, very few, very few Western practitioners have removed themselves from worldly concerns. So, in the States and in the West in general, uh, lay people are engaged in various ways with the world already, often involved in less productive activities than addressing this issue. So I don't think it's a question of, uh, is this going to interfere with my practice? Because there are a lot of other things that interfere with our practice <laughs> that we could well let go of and yeah. have energy for this. Uh, one that one, yeah, it, to me it's really interesting how mindfulness and compassion and wisdom all come together in this because it's mindfulness which allows us to come close, you know, with, with balance. Yeah. Uh, and compassion can be the motivator and the result. But it also serves one other role. It's very often people involved in social, environmental, political action. One of the big problems for many people is burnout. You know, they, they are very moved to act and, and to work on these important issues, but can't sustain it. Yeah. And to me, that's a very interesting uh, situation worthy of investigation 
because I think whether people get burned out or not in doing this or similar work is what the predominant mind state is which is motivating it. So for example, if it's anger at the situation, which would be easy, be easy for that to arise, but that's not sustainable. That's going to lead to burnout. Yeah. So here's where I see compassion. If somehow we can feel the suffering personally of others, and then we move to do some kind of action in response, if we could make compassion the motivation rather than anger. Yeah. And to me, this, this, this was also very interesting in doing the Brahma Vihara practice on compassion. Uh, because even though the formal meditation practice, as you well know, is imagining or visualizing or relating to the suffering either in oneself or others. And so the emphasis is on being aware of that suffering. But in the context of the compassion practice, the affect is uplifting. It's not depressing. Yeah. So that's kind of interesting to me that, that, that a mindset that addresses suffering can be uplifting. Yeah. Uh, so again, that gives more energy. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's just one, there was a book written which many, many years ago uh, by Ram Das and Paul Gorman about compassion. And I love it because to me, the title of the book expresses the very essence of compassionate response to anything, but particularly in this context to climate change. And the title of the book was, How Can I Help? Mm. And just as a, a mantra, as, you know, in help? any situation, but specifically How now with I this, mm. it's just holding that question. Yeah. Because I think we can each help, and we will each help, once we, once we touch the situation and touch the suffering, in a wide range of ways. Yeah. It's, like, it's not just one way, and we have to, if we can hold that question, then it might open us to what our individual contribution might yeah. be. Yeah. Uh, so it's a creative space. Yeah. You know, and How can I help? Very beautiful. There are. To go through life like that, yeah, you yeah, have to have yeah. that is okay. In whatever situation, how can I help? I'll take that along from our conversation <laughs> for me. It's a very beautiful one. Yeah, this um, teasing a part of compassion and in psychology we call that empathy is a very important aspect. This compassion, as you rightly say, is something positive. Empathy is taking on the pain of others. And that is what leads to burnout. In fact, uh, this is a uh, fairly recent development in psychology that they actually had this distinction clear. Mm. And earlier they were doing, they thought they were doing research on compassion, but they were actually doing research empathy. on empathy because they were, people were just taking on the right. pain. And that is not what compassion is about. Compassion is about, as you rightly say, coming close to suffering, but then it takes the vision of freedom from suffering as yes. its orientation point. And I think this is also important with climate change, that we are willing to come close to the horrible scenarios that are there, but that we also see the potential. Mm. Climate change has a massive potential. It is going to overthrow human civilization the way we know it. There is no question about that. But if we all make our contributions, how can I help? <laughs> As Buddhist practitioners, it could become a turning point for all of us to raise the global level of awareness, to find a way as human beings to live on this planet with nature instead of against it, and with each other instead of separation, national, racial, whatever it is. So, not in the sense of deluding ourselves, but simply seeing that no situation ever is completely black or white. Never ever. There is a positive potential, even if it doesn't seem as convincing as the dramatic consequences, but that potential is there and it is upon us to contribute to the probability that that potential can be realized. 
And each of us, how can I help? Mm. How can I help? That's really the key, I think. Mm. And for that, we have to really step out of all our narrow senses of identity, monastic, lay, Mahayana, Theravada, whatever it is, and allow each of us to make their contribution by coming close mm. and then being established in mindfulness. Yeah. Well, that's well said. Beautiful. Uh, so just to make a, another connection now between mindfulness and compassion and Vipassana practice. So a first step, not only the first step, but as a first step, um, I think it's really interesting, you know, a Vipassana practice, a lot of it is cultivating that ability to come close to suffering, to come close to what's unpleasant. And so even when we're sitting, you know, or walking or in some kind of formal Vipassana practice, in some way the practice itself is, we're cultivating that foundational understanding and willingness to come close to suffering. So if we're sitting with a pain in our knee or our back and then watching what our relationship to that pain is, Right there, we can see and we can practice, okay, can I open to it and come close? Or am I pushing it away? Am I not liking it? Yeah. Am I trying to just override it? So the practice itself, I think, the Vipassana practice, really is training us in our ability to come close to the suffering, to feel it, mm -hmm. and then motivating compassionate response. So I see the practice, the Vipassana practice, very uh, fundamental. Yeah. to our ability to do this. Yeah, yeah that is uh, very beautiful. I had never thought about mm. it in that way. And this is a very important point I think you're making there because we sometimes get almost as if there's like a split. There's these two groups and there's those who are caring about climate change and social matters in general and they don't really have the time anymore to meditate. And then they look at those others, those meditators uh, who are practicing and almost think that they are selfish <laughs> and create a sort of like a, under the banner of everything is one, create a very strange duality. And I think this contrast is really a product of imagination, Western imagination actually. I, I really don't think it works. And my own experience in Asia, you know, from the outset, like we were having this meditation center there with Godwin, we would meditate and do social work. The two mm. were not separated. Mm. And coming to the West and seeing how these things are being separated, I'm still puzzled. I still don't understand how can you, to take your example, mm. how can I come close to suffering when I meditate but not want to come mm. close to suffering when it's happening outside? I mean, where's the difference? And at the same time, then also, how can I build up this self-righteous kind of uh, 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 identity of I am doing something and these selfish guys are just meditating, they are not really facing the problem? I mean, this is, this is not very helpful. I really don't think it's helpful. Every one of us has the right to decide to what degree practice, to what degree action. But I think the important point of what, what you just said is that the similarity in coming close to suffering mm. points to the fact that there is considerable awakening potential in facing mm. climate change. This is what I yeah. also took up in my, in my, in my, in my book on climate change, the, that there is actually that, that the path to awakening and the path to facing social problems, including others, diversity, etc., they are not two separate paths they can be aligned with each other and move parallel in the same direction. And what you brought out just nicely shows how this is actually possible and how it just depends on having the clarity of understanding and correlating these activities so that they move in the same direction. Yeah, and I think there's another way also that we can see how the Vipassana practice applies to social action in addition to 
kind of strengthening the ability to come close to suffering and the openness and the willingness to do it. I think our practice, our meditation practice, really gives us the tools to watch our minds as we're engaged in yeah. social action. Okay, now I'm going to get very engaged and involved yeah. in the world, but rather to bring whatever mindfulness we've cultivated and whatever understanding. So we're watching our minds as we're engaged, because unless we're saints, we probably will yeah. be alternating between wholesome and unwholesome states, yeah. even as we're engaged in a good cause. Yeah. So I think it is really helpful yeah. uh, that we just are watchful yeah. of our own minds as, as we're engaged. Um, and as you say, so the engagement itself is part of our path. Exactly. It's, not, it's not separate from it, as you said. Yeah, and and uh, the beauty is that when I see, when I formulate for myself my engagement as a form of mindfulness practice, I become more independent from the results. Yes. You see, I do, I do what I think is right in the situation of climate change as an embodiment of my ethical and dharmic integrity. I do think that if everybody would do that would change the world, but my doing does not depend on the change of the mm. world. I am not dependent on the results. And therefore a major cause of grief and burnout is left out of the yes. place. I don't have that anymore. Because some things happen, I mean, yes. recently when the Amazon uh, forest was burning down, this is difficult to handle. but. As long as I have that strength of saying, "Good, well, this person there is doing such and such thing," and I'm not even using the name, I'm just looking at it as a manifestation of defiled mental mm. states, but I'm doing such and such thing. I have that inner strength, that inner rootedness and stability to be able to look at that and see, like, "Wow, that's what defilements can do." Mm -hmm. I don't hate that person. I wouldn't want to do something to him if I have him in front of me. It's just, this is defilement, but I am firmly grounded in my practice and I do my part. Yeah. Whichever way it goes. Yeah, I think that's beautiful and I think not only not, not being angry or hating the people who are doing harmful things, but when you put it in the context that you did, that it's really just the play of defilements in the mind. Yeah. And it's actually easier to feel compassion for that person. Yeah. You know, and just the wish, may you be free of ignorance. May yeah. you be free of delusion. Yeah. So that, again, there's kind of an uplifting wish rather than a condemnation. Exactly. You know, and so we can proceed with a much lighter, uh, more spacious heart and mind, yeah. even as we get fully engaged. Yeah. So this, uh, this I think it's really important, yeah. kind of this, this integration. Yeah of understanding the mindfulness and vipassana and yeah. compassion and wisdom. Uh, it's really all a package. It's really a package. And as we keep exploring these different facets, I more and more realize what I already thought before, that as practicing Buddhists, I think we have a key role to play in this, in this drama. I think we have a major contribution to make. And I hope that each of us is willing to have that koan. How can I help? <laughs>